Uh, today I'm going to talk about actors. I'm going to talk about the real wartime experiences of some well-known actors that you would know and uh, also specifically focusing on the cast of Dad's Army and also looking at this particular famous photograph and uh, connection with an actor or two to this photograph. Stick around. Okay, actors. Yeah, I know some of them can be a bit odd living in their head and you know focusing on the craft treading the boards doing Shakespeare and some of them are just good-looking people and somebody said hey how do you fancy being in front of a camera and their life changed all of them have some kind of backstory though and uh, I'm going to talk to you about a few of them here now one of the latter was a type uh, who I mentioned in my film on top novels not nautical novels um, Sterling Hayden he was just uh, a mariner a merchant seaman and he was picked up by somebody in Hollywood who thought he'd look good on camera and that changed his life he went to war and was working with partisans parachuted into uh, Yugoslavia during the war and uh, had a very interesting time there that's just one example there are others who left their acting profession joined the services and ended up doing training films and, and things like that but but not all of them a lot of them saw some serious action one example would be Basil Rathbone who you'd know from the Sherlock Holmes movies he joined the London Scottish Regiment as a private and soon ended up as a lieutenant in the King's own Liverpool Regiment the Scottish Battalion of the Liverpool Regiment he became a captain and an intelligence officer his younger brother was killed on the front line and that sort of fired him up a bit to uh, become a bit reckless and he would uh, conduct missions into no man's land um, unlike the other, normally at night time they would go scouting he would go in the daytime taking extra risks camouflaging himself wearing a kind of ghillie suit and covering his face with kind of burnt cork, cork and he would uh, take chances but he survived and went on to an acting career now Basil Rathbone was best known for playing Sherlock Holmes. His partner in that uh, series of films, Nigel Bruce, played Dr. Watson, had also served in the trenches in World War I and he'd been in the Honourable Artillery Company and he'd been machine gunned in the legs in the trenches in 1915 and was uh, in hospital for most of the year and was invalided out of the army. In 1916 he re-enlisted and became a commissioned officer uh, and was involved in training. John Pertwee, he was the first Doctor Who that I can remember. He served six years in the Navy. He had started his adventurous career as a schoolboy, um, riding in a circus on a wall of death, riding a motorcycle with a, a toothless lion in the sidecar. And he uh, went into a rep, rep theatre and then when World War II came along, he joined the Navy, spent six years in the Navy. He was part of the crew of the Hood, which was sunk by the Bismarck with only three survivors. He was luckily sent to officer training just before she departed for that. So uh, he ended up in naval intelligence, working alongside Ian Fleming. Um, he has spoken about developing uh, escapology training for, for downed airmen and sailors and people and a agents. Um, compasses hidden in brass buttons and um, he mentioned a pipe that was a that could fire a 0.22 bullet and still be smoked as a pipe so stuff a bit like M in the in the James Bond novels and movies after the war he went back into acting uh, he was originally cast as Captain Mannering in Dad's Army but turned it down this is such a big field actually when I began to delve into this I realized the amount of actors out there with fascinating stories um, I'm going to have to come back to this again. So what I've decided to do today is stick to people on this side of the Atlantic and uh, maybe do another one with the uh, Americans and Canadians. Um, so obviously I'm only do talking about English speaking actors because that's really who I know and who most of my most of my audience probably know. But I'm sure there are others in other countries as well. But uh, sticking mainly to British here. Alec Guinness is probably an example of the former type. Um, very much into his craft serious actor um, unfortunately known to some people only as Obi-Wan Kenobi known to others as George Smiley 
but um, he joined the Royal Navy Reserve um, in 1941. 1942, he as a seaman that was, as by 1942 he was commissioned as an officer. He commanded a landing craft during the invasion of Sicily and he also took part in missions to supply partisans in Yugoslavia. Dirk Bogard was a, an actor who featured in my top 10 nautical films um, in the movie HMS Defiant. Even rigidly in a happy ship. The ideal is always possible, sir, if the men cooperate. But you know maybe uh, from the film, he was, he was in a lot of films, but he was in uh, A Bridge Too Far, if you remember well, I'm that. Too concerned about what people he think. also fought in World War II, and he is less coy than others about the horrors of war. He was involved in photo reconnaissance analysis, and that job developed as they invaded France and the front moved eastwards from Normandy. Um, he followed along behind and his role developed from not just analysis of photographs and reconnaissance but actually targets, se selecting targets and he found himself in the strange position of on his time off his hobby was painting and as the front moved and he followed behind he would find himself painting villages that he had targeted or caused to be targeted during his job. He speaks about one particular incident he went into a field beside a village to paint the village. He kicked a football, what he thought was a football, as he entered the field and saw several what he thought were footballs, old footballs. They turned out to be children's heads that had been blown off after the children had been taken by nuns to shelter in this field at the edge of the village, uh, but they'd been bombed anyway there. Um, and that's what he discovered when he kicked one of these, what he thought was an old football. Um, he also speaks about candidly, quite candidly about the case where somebody close to him was shredded by a mine and begged to be put out of their misery and how he fumbled in uh, he fumbled to load his revolver before somebody else was able to do it um, and he was involved in coming upon one of the first camps one of the Nazi death camps Bergen Belsen and he was one of the first people in there and he spoke about the rotting piles of dead and um, served in the Pacific Theatre as well um, but he, he didn't pull his punches when it came to it. You find a lot of these people gloss over their war experiences but uh, Dirk Bogard was very upfront about how horrible it all was. I can't really describe it very well. I don't really want to. Um, I went through some of the huts and there were tears and tears of of rotting people. But some of them were alive underneath the rot and were lifting their heads and trying. <laughs> you didn't make me blub, did it? Trying to do the victory thing. That, that was the worst. Sorry. Patrick McNee, who uh, the older among you will know from the Avengers, Steed, uh, he had been, uh, he was a bit of a character actually. He had been suspended from, or, or expelled from Eton for uh, being a bookie uh, to the staff and pupils and also selling pornography to staff and pupils. And uh, that, that got him kicked out. And he uh, was getting into acting when World War II came along. He was called up in 1942 as a seaman in the Royal Navy and he uh, eventually became an officer became a lieutenant and um, he uh, actually that's the point um, often you hear that in Britain they say lieutenant in America they say lieutenant there's actually apparently a third form that they used to use in the Royal Navy they used to say lieutenant they used to just do away with the vowel altogether and almost just say tenant they would have said things like second lieutenant, uh, lieutenant commander. The court is assembled by the right honorable Lords Commissioners of the Admiralty, and I quote, to inquire into the cause and circumstances of the seizure of His Majesty's armed vessel, the Bounty, commanded by Lieutenant William Bly, and to try the said Lieutenant William Bly for his conduct on that occasion. 
um, apparently that third form disappeared over the last five or six decades as new inrush of people into the Navy presumed that they should say lieutenant and that basically the old form evaporated so just point of interest so McNee became a lieutenant in the uh, Royal Navy in charge of a motor torpedo boat uh, saw a lot of friends hurt um, saw a bit of action but was off with bronchitis for the invasion of Normandy during which his whole boat and all of his crew were lost when they were shelled by a German destroyer Patrick McNee now getting on to this photograph I mentioned this is uh, the famous photograph of Patrick Pierce surrendering at the end of the 1916 Easter Rising in Dublin. The rebels had held the centre of the city, well, had held various strong points in the centre of the city for a week and had been shelled. They had expected they would end up fighting sort of hand to hand and etc. They didn't realise that the British would just sit back and shell these strong points. So they, they were doomed from the start. But uh, they held out for a week and then Pierce and his garrison moved from the general post office which dominates O'Connell Street in Dublin into the nearby streets around Moore Street and Moore Lane um, and working from house to house and uh, locking holes in the walls and moving th mouse holing through these uh, narrow lanes and eventually their number was up so they they knew they knew they weren't going to go to save lives basically they basically decided to surrender um, this famous photograph is Pierce surrendering to General Lowe who is in charge there. Um, but anyway, the point I'm talking about, this photograph, the reason I'm talking about it is behind General Lowe is a man taking notes. That is his ADC who was his son. Um, and that his son then, after the Rising, was in France in the fighting, got captured after some time in prison camp when he was released the war was over he made his way to america changed his name to Lo loder l-o-d-e-r and he became an actor in hollywood also involved in that rising and also in that garrison or in the moore street uh, sorry in the gpo garrison under pierce patrick pierce and by the way uh, clarification here i'm saying patrick pierce a lot of people these days refer to this man, the leader of that rising, as Podrick Pierce. He was very much into the Irish language. He would have either called himself Podrick McPeerish or Patrick Pierce. He would never have mixed the, the language and called himself Podrick Pierce. That would have been horrible to him. So I'm going to call him Patrick Pierce and you should too. Um, unless you're speaking Irish when he's Podrick McPeerish. He did sign the proclamation Pierce, so I, I'll call him his English name, Patrick Pierce. Under Pierce's garrison, there was a man called Arthur Shields. Arthur Shields was one of the people tasked with crossing O'Connell Street under fire. This party of men were bringing radio equipment across to where there was an antenna set up above a particular uh, building that had some technical function. And they were hoping to broadcast a message to the world announcing the rising and the setting up of the Republic and all that. And they made several attempts to get across the street. Well, they did get across and back. And they uh, they set up this equipment and they broadcast this message to the world announcing the, the rising. And it is been claimed that it is the first ever radio broadcast. Broadcast meaning it's not targeted at a particular audience. It's not a point-to-point -point telegram, nor is it a message to shipping. It's actually a message to everybody you can hear. Um, whether it is or isn't the first broadcast uh, there's no evidence that anybody ever heard it this guy Arthur Shields went on he was taken at the end of the war taken prisoner at the end of the rising uh, surrendered with the rest went to Frangoch prison camp in Wales was released eventually made his way to Hollywood became an actor ended up in three movies with that guy John Loder the three movies were Gentleman Jim, Confirm or Deny, and How Green Was My Valley. Yanto, I haven't seen you in chapel lately. I have been too busy. 
What business, may I ask? Mine. Only asking a civil question, I was. And having a civil answer, I have been busy with the union. Unions are the work of the devil. You will come to no good end. At least I am not sitting on it, talking a lot of rubbish in chapel. Look here! Oh, it... leave it now. I'll be saying something to be sorry. And I wonder, do those two men ever get chatting during a tea break about their time on opposite sides of that conflict in the East Horizon. Now, Arthur Shields, you will know from the John Ford movie, The Quiet Man. Well, since you know who I am, or was, you know why I don't want to fight him. Yes, I, I was reading about it again this evening. See, some men collect butterflies, some stamps. My hobby has always been sports, sporting events. There it is. Trooper Thorn quits ring. He played the Protestant vicar the man who identified the John Wayne character as having been a, a famous boxer who killed a man in the ring. Uh, Arthur Shields actually was from a Protestant family in Dublin and he, uh, he I suppose that kind of belies the, the idea that it was only Catholics that were into Irish nationalism. Certainly in the South, it wasn't as clear cut uh, a marriage of politics and religion in the South the way it was, uh, uh, for example, in North, Northern Ireland. His brother, also called Shields, took the stage name Barry Fitzgerald um, and his brother went on to become quite well known as well in movies both in Ireland and in America. He played the little leprechaun of a man, Michelino Flynn I think his name was in The Quiet Man. So we're on to Dad's Army and Arthur Lowe who played Captain Mannering as you may remember. No. <laughs> a book lately hmm? called Great Leaders of Men. And you know, Wilson, there's one thing that they all had in common. Yes. Before their men went into battle, they used to tell them a joke. Ah. Hmm. We're not going into battle, are we? <laughs> we are on the front line every minute of our lives. Yeah. Arthur Lowe, uh, who played Captain Mannering, was born in Hayfield in Derbyshire. His father actually had a job special job in the railways coordinating the movement of traveling theater companies on the railways that was an actual job which is pretty cool arthur lowe wanted to become a merchant seaman but couldn't because of his eyesight so he ended up being drafted into the uh, the engineers the royal electrical and mechanical engineering corps and ended up a radar technician serving in the middle east john lemazurier who are lemazurier I'm not sure how you pronounce that, who played the extremely polite Sergeant Wilson. Right, sir. Well, the, uh, the men are ready for inspection, sir. Right. Well, I'll finish this later. Right. This is my speech for the uh, rotary dinner. I'm oh. to be the guest speaker, you know. Are you ready? Mm. Oh, how very exciting for yes. you, sir. He had served in the Royal Tank Regiment in India. Um, didn't see a lot of action. And he had said he had a cushy number during the war, really. Um, a bit like his... Uh, his character, he, he said uh, promotion was uh, thrust upon him and uh, he didn't really, uh, didn't really do a lot, but uh, he served. He does mention it on Desert Island Discs, which a lot of these people pop up on. Well, then the war came, you were in the Royal Armoured Corps. Yes. You served in India, didn't you? Yes, I was, I was sent out there and all sorts of strange places, even Pune. And uh, I had a very comfortable war. Uh, no real hardships at all. Ended up on the northwest frontier. Uh, you know, where they fire shots and friendliness, really. You know, it's a <laughs> form of greeting. <laughs> and just so you know, Desert Island Discs on the BBC website is a fantastic resource. They have, they have Desert Island Disc interviews going back to the 40s. They have a huge amount of material there. It's fascinating. If you're driving along and want to listen to a podcast, you should check it out. Um, you will find people, many well-known people, interviewed more than once on it, um, which is interesting as well. It's Desert Island Discs. Check it out. Now, Lance Corporal Jones was played by Clive Dunn. Finish the speech, sir. Oh. So that Mad Mardi what we was fighting in the second Sudanese campaign <laughs> is not the same Mad Mardi as what we fought in the first campaign. <laughs> that was his son what he begat. <laughs> 
I see. Thank you. Yes, sir. In, in my opinion, sir, he wasn't mad at all, but you know how people talk. Don't yes. You? Yes, they do. Mind you, he was mad enough the day he had his horse shot from under him. He was madder that day, I reckon. He was madder than the first mad mind he was that day. So, so I mustn't keep you, sir. Got your work to do. <laughs> Clive Dunn joined the army in 1940 and he was a trooper in the 4th Queen's Own Hussars. He was posted to the Middle East as part of the 1st Army Brigade in the 6th Australian Infantry Division. He, uh, he then fought in Greece. He also popped up on Desert Island Discs. I know that your budding career was soon to be interrupted by the war. You joined the army, didn't you? Yes, we went out to Egypt via South Africa in the 4th Hussars. I was in a tank regiment and we painted all the tanks desert colour and then we quickly painted them to Greek colour, whatever colour Greece is, and then we went to Greece. Yes. And uh, I was there a few weeks and managed through influence to get captured. Now, as the British pulled out of Greece in 1941, um, the Germans were hot on their heels. He found himself as a stretcher bearer in these rearguard actions down to the Corinth Canal area and... He ended up with a group of men who avoided capture but lived rough then uh, in a cave, uh, in several caves, being helped by locals, uh, moving from place to place, trying to keep one step ahead of the Germans who were searching for stragglers and eventually they got captured. He ended up in Austria in, a, in prison there and it wasn't the worst. Uh, when he was in Austria they were put to work, they were in reasonably comfortable conditions. Where they were staying, they had um, fashioned a key that could let themselves in and out of. Um, one of the, the, his fellow prisoners was actually conducting an affair with a local woman whose husband was off fighting with the German army. Um, they would cut trails through the woods in the summer and in the winter they'd go down to the river and they'd gather ice and, and pack ice. And uh, they were paid for this work. Um, at one point they tried to get them to work in a munitions factory but they refused outright because uh, that was a breach of the Geneva Conventions to get them to do war work and the Germans said but fair enough and they didn't push it and um, he spent four years as a prisoner and um, was demobbed in 1947 Clive Dunn John Laurie who you will know as Fraser the old Scottish undertaker in the Home Guard Company Is that an authentic decoration? Or is it some foreign thing? <laughs> that, sir, is the polar medal for the Shackleton expedition. Really? A wild and lonely place it was. <laughs> Nothing for the eye to behold but ice and snow. So they made the ribbon white. Very appropriate. But what is your not wearing your medals, Captain Barnaby? <laughs> Did he leave them at home? No talking in the ranks, Fraser. Uh, he was born in Dumfries. He was studying to do architecture when the war came along. He ended up joining a, a very ancient uh, unit called the Honourable Artillery Company and he ended up in, uh, in France, in the front line. He had, I don't know the details of his experiences, but he does mention on Desert Island Discs that he had some kind of breakdown. Yes, you were still in your teens, of course, when you were, were swept up in the First World War. You went through some of the worst of it, the Somme and Passchendaele. That's right. I got as far as Passchendaele. And then something decided for me inside that it was enough, and I found myself in a stretcher. Mm. I wasn't wounded in any way, no bloodshed whatsoever, but I was quite worn out. And what happened to you when you were demobilised? Then uh, I went back to Dumfries to pick up again with my architecture, but it was my third year, and I felt that I'd cost Mother plenty, and that I, it was time I actually made my living. And the only thing I could make my living at was as an actor. When World War II came along, he was too old to serve. He served, actually served in the Home Guard itself, believe it or not. John Lowry. Hey, puss. Hey, puss. No. Good. No. Now, Arnold Ridley, who you'll know as Private Godfrey. I thought you didn't approve of wearing these things, Godfrey. Well, it was an order, sir, and I didn't want to upset you by appearing bare-breasted. <laughs> you wouldn't have upset me, I can assure you. They come up quite nicely, haven't they? My sister Dolly had a go at them with powdered chalk and, and vinegar. Mind you, lemon juice would have been better, but we couldn't get any lemons. 
<laughs> Thank you, I'll bear that in mind. He had uh, quite an interesting experience. He volunteered after World War I broke out, enlisting in the Somerset Light Infantry. This guy got quite a few wounds in close quarter combat in the trenches. He got some shrapnel in his legs early on and he then later uh, was involved in going over the top a couple of times. On one occasion they ended up attacking a German trench. Um, a lot of his company had been hit by machine gun fire and he was one of the few survivors to make it to the German trenches where they had to try and clean out a trench using grenades and bayonets and uh, it was quite brutal. He, uh, he was bayoneted. Uh, he managed to deflect the guy going for his chest and the bayonet caught him in the groin. Um, he was also bayoneted in the hand. He, uh, he was clubbed with a German rifle butt uh, in such a way that he didn't realise at the time his skull was actually cracked and that gave him blackouts for the rest of his life occasionally. Um, his hand was badly bayoneted and they had to do a lot of uh, operations to try and save the hand but he didn't get much use out of most of the fingers on his left hand. Um, so he was eventually invalided out in 1917. He rejoined in 1939. He uh, was a part of the BEF in France in World War II and he was his job then was shepherding journalists around the place and he uh, he basically uh, did that for a while uh, was lucky to get out just ahead of the Germans um, in Boulogne he uh, was on the last destroyer out and then he was uh, basically invalided out of that um, and he joined the Home Guard and he uh, was one of two people him and Lord John Laurie were actually in the original Home Guard and uh, then uh, became Private Godfrey that we all know and love. There were other people connected to the Dad's Army program. There was a, a guy, there was a guy called Talfran Thomas. He was a, played a Welsh soldier. Um, briefly. Oh yes indeed, very good it was man. <laughs> After the parade I shall write it down and send it to Radio Fun. They pay half a crown for a joke like that. Or five bob if it's a good one. <laughs> and he uh, had been a Lancaster rear gunner in the RAF in World War II. Did many raids over Germany. Uh, one particular crash, the whole crew was lost apart from himself. And that was quite traumatic for him. And he took up acting as part of therapy for, for that, to help him with that. Harold Bennett appeared in the programme a few times. Of course, I, I could have done tall, thin letters, but that wouldn't be right. Why not? Oh, no, no. I like the lettering on the outside of the door to be in keeping with the person sitting in the desk behind. <laughs> <laughs> so I've done little short, fat letters. You'll know Harold Bennett um, from being a young Mr. Grace in Are You Being Served? He uh, seems like to have, to have been a, an adventurous chap as a young fella. He had actually left Britain and gone to America and toured as a clown with a travelling circus. Uh, when World War I came along, he served as a courier, first on horseback and then on a motorbike. Do you, you probably know Michael Bates. He would have featured in Last of the Summer Wine and also he was the, the, the main Indian character in It Ain't Half Hot Mo. Ah, excuse me, why you not dress Woman Saab up as beautiful Indian dancer? And then he can do the dance of love. Oh, Sully, that'd be a lovely idea. I've never worn a sari before. A nice cup of hot tea, Saab? Be quiet, be quiet. I'm trying to show Saab the Nach dance. Oh, Nach dance. Oh, it is very sexy, Saab. You would like it, Bombardier, oh, Saab. I very much doubt it. Saab, <coughs> this is man. And this is woman. And they are strolling through the enchanted forest. Then Sab, they see each other. And oh, oh, oh. <laughs> then Sab, man waved to woman, and woman waved to man. And then Sab, they waved to each other. Now, it ain't half hot moment was a very funny serial on BBC. Um, that they don't repeat anymore because political correctness, I guess, um, the Michael Bates character 
was sort of blacked up a bit and uh, dressed as an Indian wearing a turban and a very funny character, a uh, very likeable character. Um, the thing about Michael Bates is he actually was part Indian. His father was, was part Indian, so there was some Indian blood in him. He grew up in India. He was born in India. He spoke Urdu before he spoke English. He served in World War II with the Gurkhas. He was a major with the Gurkha Rifles in World War II. He saw action in India, up in the Northwest Frontier against the Japanese, and he was mentioned in dispatches. So um, maybe the criticism isn't, isn't all that warranted. But anyway, um, Michael Bates. There you are now. Some interesting stories about some familiar faces. Uh, there's plenty more where that came from. I'll be doing another one of these. I'll do one on the Americans next, I'd say. So I hope you enjoyed it. Bye now. Mind yourself.